ثلاثه ايام اخرهم بكره يعني كتبت تعليق <تصفيق> احمد اقول لحضرتك كتبت تعليق على الجماعه اللي هم الاخوه الفلسطينيين اللي هم اللي كانوا اسرى اه واخد بال حضرتك وقلت خليك معايا اه خليك معايا كده لان انا ايه ايوه 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 خليك معايا ايوه 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 دكتور احمد انا كده عملت ميوت لليوتيوب تمام وقلت انا زعلان طبعا من الجماعه اللي هم بيلغوا عنهم وكده يعني فعملت كومنت كده بتاع تشيرشل وحطيت مجرد حطيت الكومنت قال لي تمام محظور ثلاث ايام والله في خلال ما اقل من 15 ثانيه كانه كان واقف لي لا حول ولا قوه الا بالله Uh, Dr. Khamis, uh, thank you so much, and uh, we are going to go, we are live now on the YouTube, and uh, uh, we are going to be, لو حد من الزملاء, if anyone from our colleagues watching now can put this link on the YouTube at uh, Mega, 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 Mega Medical Group, I will be really appreciating because I cannot post anything on the Facebook at the meantime. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> we are starting with uh, nearly 50 colleagues attending this very, very important webinar. Uh, we are so proud that Dr. Ahmed uh, Taha, Professor of Anesthesia in ancient, continuing his passion about regional anesthesia tonight, and he's giving us a very unique topic. And for the first time tonight, Dr. Amina bin Yusuf from Algeria. So, uh, so welcome, warm welcome to Dr. Amina bin Yusuf for you that are two months to get that hair in the, this platform. And I would like to thank, thank Dr. Amina bin Yusuf. She bought a new computer today to deliver this lecture. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank her son, uh, uh, Yasin, for very helping us uh, tonight. And uh, really, uh, thank you very much, everybody, attending this very, very important uh, webinar. And this webinar is unique. Um, it's shared by our excellent eminent colleagues uh, from uh, Ain Shams uh, University. He's Dr. Ahmed Salama. He is assistant lecturer uh, of anesthesia and the intensive care in Ain Shams University Hospital. But he moved to UK now. He's specialist uh, of anesthesia in North Cambria in UK. And uh, warm welcome to Dr. Ahmed Salama to chair this webinar. And he will take all your questions and inquiry to Professor Ahmed Ta and Dr. Amina bin Yusuf after each lecture. And uh, all the floor for you, Dr. Ahmed Salama. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for the attendees. And thank you, Dr. Ahmed Taha and Dr. Amina. Yeah, and, I've seen you. your, and I've seen your tweet, uh, Dr. Amina, today on Twitter, your first lecture in total in English. And we, have, uh, we, are, we are really excited to, this, uh, uh, to your uh, lecture today. So uh, we're going to start with... Uh, Dr. Ahmed Taha's uh, lecture is going to be about uh, complications and prevention of um, ideal block condition. Um, I will leave the mic with Dr. Ahmed Taha for now. I would ask all the attendees to keep their questions uh, for the end of the our for the end of the lecture. And at the end of the lecture, I will have a look at each question. Um, I will see if there is any repeated questions. I will I will. Uh, tell it to uh, Dr. Ahmed Taha, so he will uh, welcomely uh, telling, us, uh, telling us answers. Uh, so uh, we were going to enjoy this uh, lecture now, okay? I will leave the mic with you and I will mute myself, okay? Okay. Thank you. Assalamu uh, alaikum You see now the the presentation. So, uh, Dr. Ahmed, so you've just started your your screen sharing. I, I, I did it. It's shared now. Is it? You can yes. see. Yes, yes, it's shared now. I think everyone should see it now. 
Okay, so if anyone has any issues with uh, like technicality or any problem not seeing the, the uh, PowerPoint, just let us know so we can fix it. Okay, go on. Bismillah ar-Rahim. One more time, we're going to have a uh, I'm Dr. Taha from Manzilla Department Health Point Hospital. Uh, previously, I worked in Anshams University. Uh, today, inshallah, we'll talk about nerve block complication, prevention, and ideal block condition. Uh, as we mentioned before, then uh, uh, nerve block is a relatively safe technique uh, compared with joint anesthesia and spinal anesthesia. Uh, it can bypass the complication of airway management, it can minimize, uh, bypass the risk of aspiration in emergency procedures. Uh, and hemodynamic instability like myocardial depression and uh, reserve uh, minima and, uh, minimal reserve function of respiratory or liver embedded function, nerve block can play a very important role. Uh, also, in compared to the spinal, it does not block the uh, autonomic fiber, so there's no instance of hypotension or retention or hypothermia. Also, the major related complication in the back, like headache and backache and hematoma, you can buy both all of them by spine by nerve block. However, nerve block is not a holy technique. It has some drawbacks. That's what we'll discuss today. I categorize the uh, drawbacks of nerve block in two four categories: uh, drug related uh, category, needle related, and combined factors, drug and, and needle, and another factor is human error. First, we'll speak about the drug-related complication of nerve block. First, it's, it's a non-pure sensory block. Uh, the, nerve fiber contained, uh, sensory, uh, the nerve fiber contains sensory fiber, motor fiber, and autonomic fiber. Uh, local aesthetic block all of these fibers. Uh, the motor fiber, when it's blocked, this may, may cause some uh, problem uh, in the lower limb. In the lower limb, the uh, uh, block of the major nerves can result in delayed ampulation. And nowadays, early ampulation is a very important target of the modern anesthesia. So to minimize this uh, delayed ampulation, either you use a short-acting local anesthetic like chloroprocaine, if you use it for anesthesia, like a new scope or short procedure. But if you do nerve block for prolonged post operative analgesia, you have to move distal to non-motor block, block uh, blocks with non-motor weakness, like a ductal canal have minimal motor weakness, or like uh, uh, being blocked. So this is the first problem with the uh, local anesthetic. Second one, it blocks the autonomic fiber. Usually the autonomic fiber is not an important, uh, is not important in many nerves. However, in only one nerve blocking the autonomic fiber, like in Budenda, uh, the Budenda nerve is used to block, uh, to perform analgesia after rectal surgery. However, the Budenda have autonomic innervation to the venous. So during the block, Time the patient have impotence, and so this is very important to inform the patient about the complication and drawbacks and some symptoms that may be happening during the block, including numbness uh, during the preoperative uh, clinical assessment. Uh, so he, the patient will not get panic when he have this uh, issue during the block time. Another important problem related to the medication local anesthetic is the local anesthetic toxicity. When the local anesthetic level in the plasma exceeding certain threshold, it results in toxicity. That's what we call it last. And this is a serious problem because it may result in a death. Uh, usually this problem happened due to two causes, either either intravenous injection, direct intravenous injection, or due to overdose injection. And the direct intravenous injection is not related to the dose. Even small dose can result in toxicity. And the symptom usually occurred immediately. Uh, and unfortunately, it's unpreventable 100%, as we'll see now. The other cause is related to the overdose injection. Uh, this is result is the, the curve is more flat, so the symptom occurs slightly delayed than the intravenous injection, and it's highly related to the dose injected. The local anesthetic dose is the uh, multiplication of the volume of the local anesthetic multiplied by the concentration. Uh, and the safe dose there is a safe dose that can be used from rubricane and marcaine, uh, or bivubricane, which is 3 milligram per kilogram. For clidocaine, it's 4.5 uh, without adrenaline. With adrenaline, it may reach 7. Chlorobricane, you can use 800 and 1,000 if with adrenaline. However, not only the dose is the only factor affecting the local acidic toxicity, it's also the rate of absorption of medication, which is variable from one place in the body, one region to the other. The highest, of course, was the IV, but the tracheal and intercostal and caudal are the highest uh, rate of absorption, so the curve will be steep, 
Uh, but alhamdulillah, less in the nerve block. So the case is more flat. So you will not exceed, or mostly you will not exceed the toxic dose or the plasma level if, if, uh, 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 if you inject in this area. Uh, some people, some physician addition of adrenaline to minimize the local anesthetic absorption and flattening the care. The last, uh, the other factors that may affect uh, this uh, uh, local anesthetic toxicity is hepatic activity. And a patient with in both liver function, especially if you inject local anesthetic in old in a long duration and longer duration, if the patient uh, if the hepatic function is impaired, this may increase the plasma. A level of amide local anesthetic because it's metabolized in the uh, uh, in the liver. Another important factor is the carrier protein. Uh, unlike the other uh, medication, uh, the uh, plasma protein carrying local anesthetic is not helping. It is uh, uh, AAG protein, and this protein is uh, level is decreased in pregnancy and neonates. So the pregnant ladies and neonates are more susceptible to the toxicity of local anesthetic. Then. Uh, usually, as I said, the symptoms start either immediately and may it increase to the 30 minutes after the block, pro uh, block uh, uh, performance because the peak of the plasma level reach after 30 minutes. So if nothing happened within 30 minutes, inshallah, no toxicity will happen. The first symptom of toxicity is uncommon. Uh, Everybody is saying that it's circumolar numbers. It's the first symptom, but this is not the usual. The usual change of the mood is change of behavior. I the patient become very aggressive of start the speech, start laughing, and it may result also with a delusion. And this delusion causes psychic problem to the patient even after control of the symptom. There come all numbers, of course, occurred from paresthesia, and this may uh, progress to coma and convulsion. And, and if the dose is higher, it reach to cardio, resulting cardiovascular toxicity, which is many, any kind of arrhythmia may occur. There's an important point here that is Naropin, uh, Rubivacaine and uh, Levo, uh, Bivobicaine have very safe profile compared to Bivobicaine as regarding cardiac toxicity. The dose may reach seven times safer than Bivobicaine. If you inject the local anesthetic in high dose in immediately intravenous, all these symptoms happen at once. But if it is more or less overdose, so the symptoms become gradual. So you start with CMS symptom and then followed by the cardiovascular symptom. The management is relied on prevention. This is more important. And all our complication today, the most important point of the manage is try to prevent this uh, problem. Uh, so use the safe drug in uh, our hospital. We don't use bifurbicin at all. It's not in the hospital. Unless heavy mechanisms exist for spinal anesthesia. But otherwise, there is no bifurbicin at all in the hospital uh, because it's uh, cardiac toxicity. Uh, the other uh, thing is that you are keeping within safe dose. Don't inject beyond safe dose. And luckily, alhamdulillah, that is all nerves can be blocked by 0.2 nerve uh, percent of narpin or bifurbicin or bifurbicin. And all of them can be analyzed by 0.3. So you don't have to use a high concentration. You can use high volume with low concentration without exceeding the toxic dose. Some physicians add adrenaline to local anesthetic because adrenaline to give two advantages. The first one, it is uh, IV marker. If you inject adrenaline, if it's uh, by mistake you inject inside the intravenous, you will find the patient will got some tachycardia. So you will stop injection to assess. And second, the adrenal uh, uh, decrease the rate of absorption of the medication and so flattening of the curve. So the blade plasma level will not exceed the toxic level. Second, and the most, most, most important is slow injection and frequent aspiration. This decreases the incidence of intravenous injection by 50%. But unfortunately, it cannot prevent it 100%. Simply, if you have a small vein and try to withdraw blood from more small vein, you cannot, the vein will collapse and you will not withdraw the drug in spite of being inside the vein. So that's what happened in the uh, blocks. Uh, you are, the needle tip is inside the vascular uh, vessel, uh, vein. When you start to aspirate, and if it's a vein is small, the vein will collapse and no blood will come out. But still, if you inject the medication, it will go to the systemic aid. So that's why uh, local safe toxicity will happen 100% with all physicians. It's like Esophageal intubation, it will happen. Nothing can prevent its occurrence. So the most second, most important, it is the detection. So no block, no block, no block, except with monitor. And this is crime. To inject local anesthetic, 
without monitoring. This is a crime. So early detection not only depends on the monitor, but physical attendance of the somebody to monitor the patient, either the assistant technician or the doctor. Somebody must be there beside the patient for early detection, because this is the most important point of the management. Early detection and the patient is fully monitored. The management depends on uh, supporting systems, and the only treatment is the intralipid. Intralipid is a medication is very important now and should be exist with any block amide local anesthetic injection. We inject about 20, uh, 150 ml uh, intravenous bolus and then followed by 350 uh, infusion. If you need more, you can inject more if the symptoms still exist. So you can give more. And the other thing is you can support the uh, uh, CNS by if the patient have aggression, aggressive or convulsion, you can inject 50 milligram of brofol. And usually, if you use, if you don't use brofolbicin, this is a, you will not find more more treatment is needed. Just these two points, and it's over and can control the symptom of toxicity. However, sometimes if the patient have brofol have high ventilation, you have to ventilate this patient. Simply, you can ambu. Uh, manual ventilation him until his breathing coming to normal, if occurred. Intubation, this is why I put this slide, intubation is not a must. Not indication, the toxicity per se is not indication for intubation. You intubate the patient if one of two things happen. If the patient hemodynamically is unstable, like even during arrest, you don't have to intubate him if uh, the ample ventilation is okay. But if you have also inefficient ample ventilation in this point, you may intubate the patient. Because intubation uh, is not uh, is a rush and everybody will, you have to give medication, muscle laxant, and you don't need this really uh, in the last. So if the toxicity happens, just uh, put oxygen mask, which is already should be uh, on the patient before the block. And if a hypoventilation happen occurred after the uh, injection of the propofol, you will just uh, manual ventilation and uh, manual ventilation of the patient will be enough. Cardiovascular, if occurred cardiovascular toxicity, suppose it as needed. If there is hypotension, you give clothes, you give vasoconstrictive, vasoactive medication. And if you arrest, follow the algorithm of arrest, unless the only exception that is if you have uh, ventricular arrhythmia, don't use the lidocaine. Uh, an important point here that after control of the toxicity symptom, you can proceed for surgery, no problem at all. The only thing is that you don't give more local anesthetic. So if they already block the patient and patient has efficient block, we can proceed to the symptom, uh, to the surgery. If the patient doesn't finish, you don't finish his blocks. So don't give local anesthetic again and just add general anesthesia. But don't cancel the surgery for toxicity. Okay. Uh, third problem related to the medication is uh, allergy. Uh, and usually the allergy is not related to the local anesthetic itself, but to the preservatives. And alhamdulillah, there is no cross allergy between, or most of the time, there is no cross allergy between the uh, uh, different local anesthetics. So, second problem with drawbacks, we'll speak about the uh, drug or needle related problem. A needle related problem, a needle can cause injury of a structure nearby the nerve. Uh, it may cause infection because it penetrates the skin and other related uh, 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 infection uh, uh, problem related to the catheter insertion. Injury of nerve valve structure that's all nerve, mostly or almost all nerves is related to vascular structure. And so there is high incidence to penetrate such as vascular structure and cause some hematoma. And most of the time there is no problem at all. Usually the hematoma is small and it will not have no consequences. Um, you, you already do uh, arterial, arterial cannulation and we do femoral cannulation, radial cannulation, and won't have, get a problem from this hematoma which occurred. But the problem occurred when the patient have coagulopathy and you perform a deep block or you injure a major vessel when this patient with coagulopathy, the hematoma size will be big. If the hematoma size is big enough, it may compress the nerve and causes ischemia of the nerve, and so causes nerve injury. Uh, uh, usually this not occur with anesthesia, although it may occur, but mostly it's due to surgery. In this image, we can find this a big hematoma in the area region, and this hematoma compressing the femoral nerve, so causing femoral nerve palsy. In guidelines, they, uh, uh, they make equalize between the uh, nerve block and region uh, and epidural anesthesia. And the same guidelines are applicable for both of them in the patient with coagulopathy. However, they give a free area that they are not say that all blocks are the same. Uh, the epidural mainly the problem is it's closed space. So any small hematoma will cause nerve damage and hard and severe increase of the pressure 
uh, rapidure respiration and nerve ischemia. How is this not the case if you do local infiltration or superficial work? So if you find the patient, uh, your patient has coagulopathy, and general anesthesia is safe, خلاص, no need to give block. It's considered a relative control indication. However, if the general anesthesia is also very risky, if the block is superficial, like femoral block or tab block or this block, you can add these blocks to help the patient for post-operative pain control. Second uh, structure that's commonly injured or can be injured during block is the uh, pleura. Uh, as you know, everybody knows the supraclavicular block, uh, you block the nerves just beside the pleura. The applica plexus lies just uh, superficial through the zoom of the pleura, and the incidence of injuring the pleura is up to 15% in landmark. With the use of ultrasound, this incidence decreases, however, still exists. You may injure the pleura during the supraclavicular block, and also the same during ventricular, infraclavicular, paravertebral, or intercostal nerve. So, pleural injury is may happen with this block. The pleural injury uh, and pneumothorax, the main symptoms, that is, you find decreased air entry in the blocked site. Uh, ultrasound provide, provide a very good tool to exclude pneumothorax, which is activation of ill mood. Then if you find the, the, this sign of the sea and sand here, you find this is the pleura moving, and this is normal, and you can exclude pneumothorax. The other differential diagnosis of intraskaline that is uh, on subclavicular that is with uh, happened due to uh, uh, isphenic block is as pneumothorax, you can find it is an entry in the blocked site. Also, it can be simply uh, diagnosed with ultrasound, just put the ultrasound, the curved probe or linear probe, and you can diagnose the movement of the frame and the thickness of the frame. So this way, the ultrasound helps very much to differentiate and to confirm the diagnosis of pneumothorax or the phrenic block. Next structure can be injured during, uh, by the needle is a muscle, so it may cause hematoma or myopathy, and abdominal viscera can be blocked during abdominal block. So we have the kidney has been in, uh, uh, reported to be injured during lumbar plexus, and liver can be also uh, uh, reported to be injured during the tap block. The golden rule in this point, never to advance the needle unless you see the tip. Full stop. If you don't see the tip, don't advance. Try to inject, uh, uh, move the needle, try to move the probe, try to inject some uh, saline. But at the end, you have to know where the needle before you advance it. This is a golden rule to minimize this instance of such complication. Uh, next problem is infection. Actually, infection with signal injection is not high. So just uh, you use uh, uh, clean gloves and uh, alcohol spray to disinfect the area. In our hospital, we also cover the, the probe with clean uh, drips. Uh, uh, this is enough because the risk of infection is not high for single infection, uh, strangulation. However, the risk of infection become higher when the patient was immunocompromised patient like diabetic or in chemotherapy, or when you insert a catheter. So in perineural catheter, you have to, everything should be sterile like epidural. You wear sterile gown, uh, sterile gloves, sterile drapes, and the, uh, 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 even the ultrasound probe should be covered by sterile uh, drapes. So, in fact, because infection is high in the case of the castor. As you see in the, uh, this case, um, uh, there is uh, the insert uh, uh, lateral popliteal uh, block uh, catheter here, and maybe the technique of sterilization was not adequate, and the salt and necrotizing fasciitis, as you can see here. This is bubbles, black point is gas, because necrotization of the fascia layers inside the body. So infection in the castor and in the compromised, it's very important to be minimized by clear and very, very uh, 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 cautious about sterility. sterility. Another problem with castor and very important is uh, malregulation and malposition of the castor. In this case in Palestine, they do intraskeletal block and single injection. After this, they uh, advance the castor and they do a horrible mistake. They don't inject in the castor. So the surgery was very smooth. The patient has no pain in the recovery. They send him to the ward. A few hours later, the patient has got some pain. Inject him 10 ml of bivirucane. The nurse come, inject him 10 ml of bivirucane. Three later, the patient dead in the bed. Post-mortem uh, diagnosis, he finds a catheter. catheter is in intrasecal. 
And this is a problem of a catheter. Never, never, never send the clear patient to the world with a catheter. You didn't inject it. You have to test this catheter. Any complication happened in the theater can be managed more better about 100 times than if it happened in the world with nobody with the patient. Another complication happened with me uh, of migration of the catheter. This patient is presented for TKR, uh, total knee uh, arthroplasty. We inject for him uh, lumbar catheter and uh, sciatic catheter. Uh, after injection of the lumbar, uh, uh, inject about 30 ml. I find severe hypotension. This could be with due spread of local anesthetic to epidural, but also we, I find that the patient have weakness in the hand. So I doubt that is there is something wrong about the catheter. So I make X-ray, and as you see, the catheter which is inserted lumbar in the lumbar area and lumbar mid plexus, it has been migrated inside the epidural and actually become a epidural, epidural catheter. So that's why uh, uh, testing the caster is very important in before you send the patient uh, uh, to the world. Uh, more common uh, complication of the caster, including dislodgement and shred, as you can see here, that is the table of the caster does not exist. And drug errors, as we'll talk later, and take care that this caster causing bleeding. Removal of caster causing bleeding like its insertion. So it's, its timing of the removal should be adjusted like insertion. Uh, usually you remove the caster two hours before the next day, uh, next dose of click sand. Uh, next factor, which is drawbacks of local anesthetic, we speak about combined uh, some problems that happen due to many factors. Uh, first, field block, second, nerve injury, and third will be local anesthetic spread. Uh, in the field block, uh, uh, this is a very common problem. Our, uh, 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 Dr. Marover, uh, told us now one time that is we have a, something called chain of success. Chain of success, it is uh, if you inject the right drug, a drug meaning that's right local anesthetic type, right volume type, and right concentration. If you inject it close to the nerve in the correct position or right position, so you identify the nerve accurately, the ultrasound or nerve stimulation, and you choose the accurate nerve or the right nerve, so you inject the right drug in the right position of the right nerve, depend on the surgical anatomy and the regional anatomy of the surgical field, you will get successful block. And the success block and field block is actually, if you follow this three point, you inject the right drug on the right position of the right nerve, the success rate is extremely high. Extremely high. You will not feel it in most of time. Field block, but the problem, you have to assess the patient. So you have to know that your block is filled before shifting the patient to the uh, operating theater, especially if you use this block as a sole anesthesia technique. One point important here, that if you do plexus block, you had to assess each nerve separately. So for example, you do lumbar plexus block. So lumbar plexus supply lateral femur cutaneous and obturator and femur. So each of them should be assessed separately because simply if you place a look anesthetic, it may block one of them, this nerve, but didn't block the other. So you have to supplement the other. So you will not get the information unless you examine every nerve, each nerve alone by itself separately. So if you did the block and the block doesn't work, you have two choice. First choice to seek you do uh, to repeat the block. Uh, more distally, if you must do lumbar plexus and you find that the obturator is not adequate, you can add obturator block. Same for the upper limb. If you do infraclavicular, you will find the ulnar nerve or the uh, radial is not adequate. You can uh, do rescue block. However, this will be okay. You can use this if the, you still no, didn't use the high dose of local anesthetic. So if there's a chance to use more local anesthetic, class, you can use it, and this will be a good option. But if there is, you used already in the first block, high dose of local anesthetic, and you cannot do more, if you exceed the local anesthetic uh, safe dose, so better be in safe side and add light genesis. So I give it an infraclavicular, it doesn't work 100%, it's okay, no problem. We will add general anesthesia, light genesis. The only problem here, never, never, never uh, uh, give sedation to patient in pain. So if the surgery, the patient have pain, don't give him sedation. It will be a, a cr crisis because sedated patient, you cannot control him and he will do any movement come to his brain that you don't control and when he has pain. And so it, the situation will be a mess. Uh, I know one uh, physician do this and the patient turn in the prone position with the open wound. 
because the patient in block can move. It's not like spinal. You have motor block in bilateral and motor block of the back muscles. This is not the situation in the nerve block. The nerve block, patient can stand up. So if the patient is in pain, treat the pain with painkiller or give general anesthesia. But not use sedation to correct pain. You use sedation to uh, sedate anxious patient or to make him loss of memory, amnesia, but not to correct pain. This is very important point. A second problem with nerve block or combined factors that is nerve injury. Usually nerve injury occur due to um, surgical causes because we have many, many, many surgical causes can cause uh, nerve injury. We as anesthetists, we don't know that this nerve, the incidence of nerve injury is very high after even during anesthesia because we don't see the patient uh, after surgery. Yeah, for example, the patient comes to you with a fracture uh, femur, a fracture uh, humerus, you give them general anesthesia, then the patient go home and later he comes with radial nerve injury. You don't know because the patient will come to the surgeon. We, the nerve could be injured due surgically due to compression, like tourniquet retraction and long prolonged retraction. We have one case happened because of prolonged retraction during surgery and wrong suture. Uh, direct trauma may occur like uh, grafting, in earlier graft, they may injure the lateral femur cutaneous. And very important stretching, the stretching, that position, even for none uh, in a very far position of the surgery site, you may get nerve injury. We have one uh, in one hospital before I work, the patient in uh, anterior perineal section for about seven hours, we put the hand like this, upward both hands, and the patient get bilateral pachial plexus, plexolopathy. The whole pachial plexus is bilateral. Also, correction of valgus, uh, valgus knee correction. When they correct the valgus knee, they stretch the common pronail. So this causes uh, ischemia of the common pronail. The same happens with this segmentation. Breast segmentation also that occurred when the, when the breast was a big uh, uh, implant. Uh, the, you stretch the, the nerves of the intercostal nerve, and this may cause nerve injury. Same for shoulder replacement. Some kind of shoulder replacement called reversed shoulder replacement. This is also expand the distension, the, the, the uh, dimension of the nerve. The same happened with dislocation and distension, even with flip. Another cause for nerve injury due to surgical is hypoperfusion. During surgery, tourniquet and this issue make ischemia of the nerve, and if it's prolonged, and ischemia of the feeding vessel, and this called nerve injury. Nerve injury can occur even after surgery. Like if the patient developed hematoma after surgery, uh, if the patient developed compartmental syndrome, if the patient have tight wrists, they sometimes the surgeon after the total knee, he have some bleeding through to mm -hmm. bleeding, mm -hmm. bleeding, mm -hmm. tight dressing, and this may cause uh, 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 compression of the nerve and nerve injury. Another factor for risky patient, uh, the patient himself have a risk because he has pre-existing neurological disorder. And this is a very important, you document this in the pre-operative assessment. Because you be legally protected, you know that this patient had this medical problem, had this nerve injury before you do the block. Of course, anesthesia is not 100% uh, free from this complication. Anesthetic medication also can cause nerve injury. Uh, either due to pressure when you inject inside the nerve, and intranular, the pressure inside the nerve got high, and so it causes obstruction of all feeding vessels. So the patient, the nerve will get ischemia. The chemical medication, the local anesthetic and adrenaline are neurotoxic medication, actually. But fortunately, we use a very low concentration. But in high concentration, it causes clearly cytotoxic and neurotoxic medication. Also, the needle trauma itself may cause nerve injury. Uh, in the long beveled needle, usually, or, or sharp needle, that is usually the problem, it is more frequent, but it runs. In blunt needle, this is less frequent, but the, it takes longer time to recover. So we have a lot of causes of nerve injury, and sometimes you cannot differentiate why this patient got this problem. The symptoms, uh, 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 most of most of time, it becomes sensory symptom from paresthesia and pain, and it become more uh, plus or minus motor symptom. But in uh, in it's really to be purely motor symptoms. The onset, as we said, usually started by delayed recovery. But in some patients, the patient may recover totally of uh, neural function. Then later he come with nerve injury. 
we have one uh, patient uh, a few weeks ago he has a fracture uh, humerus uh, under general anesthesia no block and during the surgery they undefined the radial nerve and they extract the radial nerve and try to fix the bone unfortunately this simple traction causing radial nerve injury and the patient wake up with uh, radial nerve injury so there is a lot of causes of nerve injury, including anesthesia, pre-existing patient condition, and also the uh, 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 surgical causes. Types of nerve injury depend on what structures is injured. Uh, the the neuropraxia, that's only in the myelin sheet is affected, and usually have a very good prognosis. The opposite is axonotemesis, that is the axon is affected and the prognosis is variable. But neurotemesis, this is a very bad prognosis because both are affected, the uh, myelin sheets and the axon of the nerve. As we said before, that's the most important is prevention. The most important is prevention. Unfortunately, again, it's not 100%. You cannot prevent it 100%. The first prevention point, avoid doing nerve block for risky patient or risky surgeon or risky procedure. So if you know that the procedure had a very high risk of nerve block, try to avoid nerve block. If, for example, the patient would do valgus knee correction, no nerve block, or uh, no nerve block. If the patient would do reverse shoulder replacement, I don't know, do nerve block. If the surgeon himself is not expert or not appreciating, no nerve block. If the patient have already drop foot, I not never do sciatic in a, a patient with drop foot. He's already have a nerve injury. But if the so this to me is a relative contraindication, but if the patient condition cannot permit you to do another technique, yeah, I cannot give him general anesthesia at the same time because he has a lot of risk, have a relative problem, cardiac problem, and this bullet will do the same like we said before. Either we give short acting local anesthetic like robrocaine, so we can assess the patient immediately after surgery, or you give blocks with no motor weakness, like uh, uh, the nervation block on the shoulder, you break the distal branches of the pectoral, the axillary, and suprascapula. Distal branches, articular branch, not the main branch, not, not the main branch. So in this way, you uh, avoid the motor weakness. Uh, uh, also, uh, bend the block and adductor canal, so you can assess the motor function immediately after surgery. <coughs> Sorry. Another technique that to, to uh, boost bone the nerve block after surgery. So I not do the nerve block as usually before surgery. No, I will wait until the surgery finish and I assess the patient. Then I did I do the nerve block because the surgical cause I bypass some of this surgical cause. However, as I said, some surgical cause occurred postoperative. So this is also not one hundred percent sure that you'll avoid nerve injury. Second way to avoid nerve injury to avoid intraneural injection. How to avoid or try to avoid the nerve injury? The nerve is surrounded by three uh, fascial uh, sheets, the epineurium outside, then perineurium, then the endoneurium. If you inject outside, this is called extraneural injection, and this is a safe technique, and this is what we want, to inject outside, extraneural. If you inject deep to the uh, epineurium, this is called a sub epineural, and if you inject inside, uh, uh, beside the endoneurium, uh, um, uh, deep to the perineurum, this is called uh, subperineural injection. Only the sciatic nerve has another fascial layer called paraneurum, and if you inject deep to it, it's called sub subparaneurum injection. And this is a safe technique also. So we have two safe techniques, this technique and the extra uh, neural injection. The other two injections, that is the pressure increase inside the nerve, and this causes nerve so we want to avoid this during injection. So if you use nervous stimulator, don't inject if the, uh, you have to reach uh, at 0.2. This means that you are inside the nerve. If you use ultrasound, try to make the tape outside the nerve. Don't inject inside. If you don't see the tape like in deep blocks, add nervous stimulation. So be sure that you are not injecting inside the nerve. Also, if you find pain and paresthesia during injection, so stop injecting. And this assist and the assist the patient. Uh, pain and paresthesia is not sensitive and not specific, but still you have to respect it. And if the patient got pain during injection, you have to stop and assess this pain and ask him where is the pain and if it's a distribution of the nerve, change the needle tip position. Also, don't uh, inject against high resistance. Uh, so some people uh, use uh, a device 
that shows the pressure you're injecting. The red one, the meaning that you inject against high resist. Uh, today, I have just seen a paper published in uh, regional anesthesia shows that even this technique is not sure you are not in, even in the safe zone, the, this pressure mode giving the safe zone. However, you may still inject inside that new. Another uh, thing to avoid resistance that you usually use 20 cc syringe, not 10, not 5, during block, like when you do the uh, BLS block. It's not allowed to be done by 10 or 10. This is physics because when you inject in uh, 20 ml, the pressure is, is less. So you can detect high pressure and high resistance. And we should, uh, if you are doing nerve block a lot, you should use the same syringe, type of syringe. If you use BD syringe, use BD syringe. And that's why the people developed sensitivity to the uh, 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 normal resistance and abnormal resistance. However, as I said, all these precautions does not prevent the, uh, do not prevent uh, the extra, uh, intraneural injection. And it still may occur, but at least you do your best. Yeah, and we do, uh, uh, we are not gods, we do our best. Uh, I try to uh, adjust the nerve stimulator. I try to see the tip of the needle. I try the nurse assisting me. I ask him about resistance. If the pain, I stop. And then uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decide will happen. But I do my do always my best. Uh, uh, the other problem, the other uh, uh, of the management that's early detection. Early detection means that you assess the patient and a lot after search. So frequent post-operative assessment is routine in our hospital. The nurses in the world assess the patient by themselves to confirm this is a block fate. Uh, the patient can be discharged home with blocked limb. However, he has must be clearly instructed that this how to take care of a blocked limb because he doesn't feel pain. So his cigarette may harm his hand because he doesn't feel the pain. And also instruct him that if he broke is not recovered within certain times, he come back to the hospital. As I said, delayed nerve injury may occur, and so we follow up this patient for many weeks after surgery uh, during the physio uh, physiotherapy visit. So in the physiotherapy, the physiotherapist also assists the patient uh, motor function to be sure that is everything is normal. Uh, if a patient undelayed, if delayed recovery of a nerve happened, we should suspect or diagnose, primary diagnose this is have a nerve injury. In this case, you have to inform the surgeon and the neurologist. So should be this team taking care of the patient management, the anesthetist who do the block and the surgeon and the neurologist. And the surgeon, because the surgeon may have surgical cause, and if the surgical cause is treated, the patient will be improved. We go to the patient uh, Doppler and CT MRI to exclude any surgical causes. And to our for our side, we do nerve conduction and EMG. I want to tell an important point here, that is a, a nerve conduction test is telling you where is the level of the lesion, uh, but doesn't tell you the type. The type needs about one month to confirm what is this type of lesion. And so the prognosis depends on the type. So try as possible, as, as much as possible to make your block away from the surgeon. So if you do this uh, technique, it will can differentiate if the lesion is usually mostly due to anesthesia or due to surgical cause. But if your block is close to the surgery site, we cannot differentiate. Uh, then if the patient got this problem nerve injury, uh, we do investigation. If you find correctable surgical cause, we treat it and the patient inshallah will cover very soon. And if that dressing is tight, we uh, uh, release the tight dressing. dressing. If there is uh, hematoma, uh, we correct it uh, in our in our hospital. The surgeon have a wrong suture, and he explores the sciatic, and he do uh, in our case um, he had do uh, in out uh, meniscus repair, lateral meniscus repair. So he is inside the knee, and the needle and suture coming from out and compressing the uh, uh, common tibia nerve. So it got injured, and post operative he think that this may be cause of his surgery. He although the nerve the patient was under nerve block. He did expose the sciatic nerve and he find a common pronoun and he find the suture, he cut it in the same day, the patient recovered the motor function of the foot. And during this time until, if the cause is not correctable by surgical, and we are depend, the prognosis will depend on the type of the lesion, if it's axonal or myelin sheet depend, uh, lesion. Uh, during the meantime, during this, we'll treat the patient pain and uh, assurance, we'll give him analgesics and medication for uh, uh, physiotherapy, maintain the physiotherapy. In some cases, we may need to transfer nerve transplant. 
uh, no stones play, which had to migrate one nerve instead of the one with the injury. <coughs> Another problem due to combined factors that is called local anesthetic spread. In local anesthetic spread, you inject local anesthetic in certain position A, and the local anesthetic go to position B. So usually this is an advantage in most of time, like when you inject into skinny block and you find that is the local anesthetic spread to superficial cervical, and subgluteal and paracyclal sciatic block, the local anesthetic spread to the other branch of sacral plexus, especially in paracyclal and subgluteal, it goes to the posterior cutaneous nerve of the, of the, of the, of the, of the side. Also, when you inject fascia iliaca, the local anesthetic spread to the femoral and lateral, fem uh, and lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and here in the example of the spread of local anesthetic, when you do the uh, erect spinal block, that's in this site they inject 10 to 30 ml. As you see, the extent of the block is higher than when you inject 10 ml. So local anesthetic spread is actually, in sometimes it becomes a good advantage, but still it's maybe a bad advantage, disadvantage in some blocks. As an interscaline, the local anesthetic may spread to the uh, sympathetic trunk and causing corner syndrome. And in 100%, it's spread to the phrenic nerve, causing phrenic nerve uh, hemodiaphoretic uh, paresis. It may also spread to the brain and to you through the vertebral artery or to spinal or epidural space. The same with lumbar plexus, as we mentioned a few uh, slides ago. And I had a case of uh, subdural injection that I do lumbar plexus block with nerve stimulator and local injectings through, spread through the subdural to the brainstem and the patient get brainstem block, becomes suddenly apneic, the hemodynamic was stable, but the patient got dilated fixed bubble and total apnea. Intubate him and after the fade of effect of medication about two or three hours, the patient uh, recovered his conscious and everything alhamdulillah and he was safe alhamdulillah. So spread of local anesthetic may occur and so you just, you must be, you must monitor your patient, closely monitor, so any problem happen, you can correct it immediately. Another problem is spread of local anesthetic, that local anesthetic may spread from uh, with iliogwine, iliogastric to the femoral nerve. So if you do iliogwine, iliogastric block, you should inform the patient he may got some weakness in the femoral nerve. As you see here in the MRI, and this investigation is the local anesthetic injected here, and it can have an access uh, to the femoral nerve. So this local spread is an important problem. Uh, uh, lastly, unfortunately, we have also a human error factor that may cause a lot of complications in the nerve block. Uh, this human error, either medication error, either in preparation of medication. I said some stories happen in, uh, in Egypt, unfortunately. Uh, this bivacane uh, bottle is used by some nurses, surgical nurses, to, uh, for biopsy, so they add formalin here. Uh, the doctor doesn't know that's inside the formalin. He take some medication from inside, injected the codal, the patient got paraplegia. So never, never use open and boot unless you open it and you should mark and write down when and what, how and when you open it. And if somebody open it, don't use it. These two medications killed many patients, up to 10 patients now in Egypt. This is a similarity between the BVKN and cyclocaprum. This is a heavy marcaine. The company make the same ampoule to the cyclocapron. When the cyclocapron injected inside the intercecal space, the patient died. This happened in many patients in Egypt, unfortunately. Another case, in this case is, uh, I saw it in, in a previous hospital, I work in it in Saudi Arabia. The patient is pregnant lady and she has a epidural caster. And we give uh, we uh, adjust the syringe pump for oxytocin injection and and uh, local anesthetic uh, injection from the epidural caster. The the switch has switching happened between the caster and the nurse puts the oxytocin inside the epidural and the local anesthetic intravenously. This may kill the patient. Alhamdulillah, this patient didn't die, but but this is a catastrophe. So very careful of taking the medication and double check policy should be applied if possible. And labeling of the lines is very important. And labeling of the syringes, this is not a fantasy. This is, this is a real patient life. Patient loses life. This formalin, this, the baby become quadriplegic for, uh, paraplegic for life. Just simply because the doctor doesn't take 
strict to the taking a, a, a new ambu, closed ambu. He take formalin and he doesn't know. Another problem, in, uh, so either the problem of medication in the preparation and you inject wrong medication, or you have the wrong, good, uh, the, say, uh, the uh, proposed medication, but you inject it in another route. Like when you go and have a pre caster and send it to the world and the nurse is connected. So education of nurses is very important because if you, the patient, the nurse will attend with the patient more than you, more time with the patient. So, and any problem happen, it will affect the patient. So training of the nurses was very important. And lastly, about the errors is the wrong side block. Unlike spinal and epidural, we don't face this problem at all because the spinal block those limbs and they generally block everything. And so we don't care about the laterality in these techniques. However, in nerve block, this is very important because nerve block block one region. So you must, uh, the uh, uh, wrong block happened in 1% in cases. There's one study showed that it's may occur in 1% of cases. And this is a big instance. You block and give block anesthetic and a toxic dose to non-used limb. So the guidelines now do a uh, 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 policy called stop before block. That is the anesthesia doctor and anesthesia technician double check the patient name and the procedure and the block limb before performing the block. Okay. So to summarize uh, this uh, uh, things uh, together, uh, we will repeat again this uh, chain of success, which right drug was under, uh, or placed in the right placed in the right position of the right nerve under right condition. We'll summarize all these right condition now. First, in the preoperative assessment, you assess the patient very carefully. If the patient have any relative contraindication to nerve block, you should document it. You neurologically assess the patient and you know what's uh, wrong with the patient and for your legal protection. Uh, and also, you educate the patient about the procedure and suspected drawbacks. And so the patient will not get panic uh, during the uh, uh, after surgery or after the block. And also, he'll help you during the uh, performance of block. And if the patient is uncooperative, you should identify this during a preoperative visit and you decide if you'll get general anesthesia or add heavy sedation during block and after. Before block, we have this uh, specific side we call it block room. And with this block trolley or regional anesthesia trolley, which contain all medication you need and all gloves, uh, nerves, needles, everything you need for block is here, including uh, uh, intralipid. Uh, this is rather than the crash cup. So this is a regional anesthesia cart. It has everything we need, nerve stimulators, uh, catheters, uh, needles, uh, ECG monitoring, the gloves, uh, sterilization, uh, everything, everything we needed. And before block call the patient adequately time. In nerve block, we are not hurry. Like spinal, we don't have two hours to work. No, no, we don't have this problem in nerve block. We can bring the patient and do the block. I can bring him one hour before surgery. I do my block and I assess my block. I confirm that the block is working. If not, I redo the block. So bring the patient early. This will give you enough time to work and to assess the patient because the most problem in many theaters now and many physicians, they bring the, they do block on the table and he will not assess the block if he do not do the table. Stop before block. Before you do the block, you have to confirm the surgery site and the uh, surgery itself and the patient. Monitoring the patient is mandatory, mandatory. Insertion of the uh, IV line and auction and applying auction and basic monitoring is mandatory before performing the block. Sedation of the patient. This is a very important point. Uh, Midazolam is very important, not because of the sedation itself, but also for amnesia. Because if the patient got delusions and toxicity, this delusion will cause to him psychotrauma trauma for a weeks after the procedure. So very important here to give midazolam before the block as a sedation and at the same time, if toxicity happened, the patient will not remember. So you save the psychic trauma. Okay, so midazolam is a very important medication. Some may use brufol sedation during block performance. If the patient will insert the catheter, you have to do the good wrapping and cleaning and use a trial technique. This before the block. The timing of block we discussed it before, I prefer to inject, to do all my blocks before surgery. Uh, in some patient, if the patient is very anxious or the kids are not cooperative, you may not do it after induction. Uh, in cesarean section, because of the presence of the baby, we postpone the block to after surgery. 
However, the classic is to perform the block before induction. When you perform the block, you do careful aspiration. If you find blood, stop and don't inject, and same time you slowly inject, because if any problem happens, you inject only 5 ml. But if you inject like this, so 20 ml is gone, and you cannot get them back. So it's very slow injection, and listen to the heart rate while you're injecting. If they find any arrhythmia happen, any tachycardia or any bradycardia, stop and assess what's going on. And avoid intraneural injection, don't inject against resistance, don't inject in the pain, don't inject uh, 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 if the patient has paresthesia or pain, and don't inject against resistance. Uh, the, after injection, you have to monitor the patient physical monitor, not by, only by central uh, uh, monitoring. Physically, somebody must be beside the patient for symptom and signs of lust, which may which, uh, for 30 minutes minimum. And you, of course, you monitor the hemodynamics. You assess the patient carefully, assess every nerve you perform, if it's adequate or not, and if it's not adequate, you compare our secure door, secure block, or you change your plan, you'll add general anesthesia on it. Intraoperative uh, headphones, if the patient is awake, you can use headphones and put some music or Quran as the patient uh, uh, prefer. Uh, warm the patient, usually warm feeling, warm patient equal warm feeling. You may use uh, 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 sedation intraoperative like Profol or Remifentanil, but as I said before, don't sedate in complete block. Take care that sedation must be monitored. The Michael Jackson, if you know, he might die by five million by Profol. Simply, nobody monitor that. So if you sedate the patient, you must monitor his breathing. Put capnogram under the mask to monitor the breathing of the patient. Especially if the patient breathing is beyond, uh, is not accessible to you. Yeah, for example, if you do shoulder surgery in lateral position, so the patient is covered by drapes. And if you give sedation in the IV line, you don't see the patient breathing. So you have to monitor his breathing and put the capno. This is a very, very important. If you sedate the patient, you must monitor the breathing. As we said, both operative and after discharge, you should examine the patient frequently to be sure that is this uh, he has a recover of the nerve uh, block. And if you insert the caster, you have to check that uh, uh, it is transparent. You check the site of injection. There is no uh, redness. There is no signs of infection. And take care of the timing of the removal of the caster. As we said, caster removal may cause bleeding. So adjust its timing with the anticoagulant. Uh, discharge, as we said, we can discharge the patient with blocked limb. There's no problem if you have a good infrastructure. But if you are in a rural area and the patient will travel 300 kilometers away, so don't do this. If you have uh, infrastructure, good infrastructure, you have a good communication, you can communicate with the patient. The patient can access to the hospital backward, uh, to the hospital or ER uh, easily. You can do this. If not, no need. Be safe and don't send the patient except after recovery of the nerve. In uh, some country, Western country, with a very good infrastructure, they can send the patient with even catheter at home. So in this photo, the patient has self-catheter injection, and she can inject herself if she has pain with the catheter. I hope uh, that uh, these points uh, we discuss is, very, is clear, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Ahmed Taha. Thank you for your nice lecture. Um, actually, I have to look at the questions here. So I have questions in the questions and answers. So the first question says, um, can we use lidocaine for uh, tachyarrhythmias resulting from uh, pubivacaine uh, toxicity or like, or any, or any kind of local toxicity, can we use lidocaine for uh, cardiac arrhythmias? If it's when you do local anesthetics, so prefer not to use a local anesthetic. And it's logic sense. Don't use local anesthetic. Try to use another medications that may minimize this heart rate. But don't use local anesthetic again, because you will add a problem. This is the same structure of amide local anesthetic, so don't use it again. So this is the only precaution, and you can use any other medication, amidarone if you want. You can use beta blocker according to the type of uh, arrhythmia, but don't use bifocaine. And the more important than uh, the lidocaine is the intralipid. So this is a very important point. The uh, intralipid uh, uh, clear the medication from the systemic medication, from the systemic circulation, and so minimize the, the uh, level of the endoplasm. So start with this, and then try to assess the patient if you need some another medication. But don't use lidocaine. Uh, 
Okay, that makes sense to be honest, yes. Okay, um, anyone else have any questions before uh, going to Dr. Amina Ben Youssef? Anyone else yeah. has any questions? Yes, I have a question for Dr. Ahmed. Uh, um, I just want to know, uh, you, as you said, local anesthesia systemic toxicity, it can range from uh, circumoral paresthesia to this. So you said what, you know that is there is any evidence to continue or to uh, cancel the procedure? If, for example, if you got an arrest and uh, the patient resuscitated, will, will you, you continue the procedure as if, you said or not? If you control the symptom and signs, proceed for search. We have in uh, our hospital, we do a lot of blocks. So we have a lot of toxicity. Yani we face about 100 toxicity in the last 15 years. We never stop the procedures. We will continue for procedure if you control the symptoms. If the symptoms don't control, the patient still unreliable and stable, the patient at rest and become post-operative. So you do post-operative uh, uh, care. So in this point, no, of course we're not. But if the symptoms and signs and everything come to normal, normal, you can proceed for surgery. Uh, I don't know, know if uh, I, I don't know if there is evidence of this, but uh, we we proceed in these fifty cases, and we never cancel any patient with uh, uh I don't know. This is not, uh, of course, a good uh, level of evidence, but that's what we do uh, in our center. Uh, we proceed uh, for surgery unless uh, complication uh, if the complication control. In this patient with, uh, with subdural uh, spread, this is the only patient we accept, but this wasn't toxicity. But because we use Narpen, so most of the time our toxicity is only uh, CMS toxicity. And so once controlled, we go for surgery, even awake patient. We keep the patient awake. If the finish, we finish the block. We did the femoral static and the obturator and the patient got the toxicity after these blocks. We can all use the only nerve block as the only technique for block. However, if the symptom is not controlled, as you said, the patient have arrested. So, of course, uh, yeah, he will be shifted to the ICU, not for the search. Uh, another question. Uh, um, uh, this is in our experience in our hospital. Uh, in the last few uh, years, we see many, many patients can be uh, taken, get an anesthesia or analgesia for many days. Is this happening with your patient? You know, for example, I give lipoprotein 0.25, and the patient is still for two days, uh, analgesia or anesthesia. Uh, you see that in your hospital? Yes, but actually it is patient dependent, not due to the medication. Yani, we have one patient, uh, he stay with nerve blocks, uh, scale in three days, and uh, I discovered that this the same patient has the same problem, is the same with another ho hospital, but he didn't mention it before. So the patient wasn't, I was worried that the patient has a nerve injury and I tried to investigate and the patient smiling. And he said, no, this is normal to me. So some patients have uh, either delayed uh, uh, recovery of uh, blocks, especially if you find this in many nerves. Yani I do femoral, sciatic, obturator, lateral cutaneous, and all of them did not recover. It's difficult to have nerve injury in four nerves. So if this uh, case, you find the nerve, the patient, uh, usually, uh, the patient himself have something about take uh, uptake of local anesthetic and may he go delayed local anesthetic recovery. But, uh, but this is not the common. So if the local anesthetic is delayed recovery, you have to investigate. And if everything is normal and patient recovery, it's okay. But if there's something serious, you have to detect it early. So if, for example, you do a uh, femoral nerve block, uh, I expect that is uh, naropen will give analgesia or uh, symptom uh, weakness for about 18 hours or 24 hours. If the patient have beyond this motor block or sensor block, I will start to investigate what this. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, Mr. I think there is another lecture, Dr. Salama, another lecture from Antonio. Uh, for the total hip arthroplasty, there are few articles. Last say, uh, one dose of local infiltration, Robivikin, 500 milligram for whatever weight. Is it safe? I don't know. 500 milligram? Yeah, uh, whatever weight, you know, it's not related to the weight. Usually, we give the local anesthetic according to the weight, uh, weight of the patient. There's one study showed that is lumbar plexus uh, with uh, sciatic nerve block, 
and 400 milligram was not associated with toxicity, but you cannot rely on such thing. Uh, this need a lot of a lot of studies and a lot of evidence to use such high dose. Uh, if you use it and you don't have a problem with this, you can study this and make it uh, uh, official study and take an ethical committee approval, and then you can try this. But one single study showed that this medication is safe in this dose is not enough evidence to use such high dose. And the point is, you don't have to use 500 milligram. Yani, uh, Naropin is effective in the concentration of 0.2. So if you have 0.2, you can use 1.5 milligram milliliter per kg. So why use 100? So if you use 200 milligram, you can use it in 100 ml. So why you use more than 100 ml? Why you need 500 milligrams? This is a huge dose. Uh, a single paper is not enough to be a good evidence to you to use such dose unless you do a study and take an ethical approval and uh, patient confirm the patient uh, acceptance of all this. But I don't think that this is uh, uh, this is uh, maybe safe, but I didn't I didn't use this such do high dose ever. Uh, I have only one academic committee here, Prof. Ahmad Taha, uh, because we have yesterday uh, more than 300 candidates attended the European Diploma of Anesthesiology exam in Cairo. And I would really recommend this lecture and the coming lecture, uh, Complication of Muscle Relaxant, uh, absolutely uh, is a high priority to study for them in the exam, for the oral exam coming soon. I wish all of them good luck. Uh, 306, uh, 306 candidates yesterday sat for the European Diploma exam, and I wish to, to meet all of them in the oral exam very soon. And uh, this lecture is absolutely very, very demanded and very uh, important to review uh, because that question of the exam is, is one of the highest coming complication of muscle relax, a complication of local anesthetic, complication of muscle relaxant, how to avoid local anesthetic complication. All of these are absolutely, uh, you know, very easy to answer, but need to be very well organized. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Ahmed Salama. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I've got a couple of questions here and questions and answers. So the first question is asking, so uh, what's the total amount of local anesthetics for local infiltration, infiltration analgesia? And he's tried to explain this saying that local infiltration made by the surgeon in um, uh, enhanced recovery arthroplasty. It should so, not uh, save those. So you yeah. as, as much as you want. If you want it diluted, 1,000 ml diluted, but not exceeding the safe dose. Okay? Yeah, because he's saying subparticles. Uh, with uh, we don't compare it with uh, uh, this liposuction because in liposuction they suck back the local anesthetic. It hasn't it doesn't have the time to be absorbed, and they suck it with the blood in the liposuction. So it's not the same. You cannot use a huge dose of local anesthetic uh, beyond the safe dose. This is, you, you, if any problem happened to the patient, will be legally uh, uh, re, uh, responsible for this. So you can dilute the local acidic can work in 0.0% of concentration and at very low. Yani I have a study uh, to uh, calculate the concentration of local acidic required for femoral nerve block, and I find it's 0 0.1, 0 0.17 of local anesthetic can make anesthesia of the femoral nerve. So you don't have to use high concentration. 0.15 is enough to do an analgesia. If you use 0.15 and use 200 milligram, this means that you need about 130 ml. So yes, if you, you dilute local anesthetic as you want, but don't exceed the local anesthetic toxic dose. So See, I hope this made the, made the answer clear because he's mentioning that some articles, uh, especially Vintitoli, use a huge amount of uh, local infiltration, 500 mils, which I find very, very unsafe to give 500 mils of if, local uh, uh, look, uh, especially uh, ribovacaine. You have a lot of factors affecting this, including, as I said, the amino, uh, the carrier protein, the liver function. You can standardize this in all patients. If it works in a young patient, it will not work in another. And if you do block routinely, uh, the answer of toxicity with me is one per thousand. So I did, I have about 50 or 60 cases 
and يعني if the toxicity happen and uh, if you use a bifurcan or another medication, this patient may die. So it's not a, not a, it's not a, you don't put your patient at risk, especially if no need. يعني what is the need to use high dose? Okay, so the next question is, is I can't find it very clear because he says that if you if you use adjuvants, how to differentiate local anesthesia toxicity, local uh, local anesthesia local anesthesia drugs toxicity. So if we use adjuvants, how to differentiate? I can't understand the question very well, to be honest. Adjuvant does not affect toxicity. Adjuvant affect uh, the only adjuvant affect toxicity is benef, uh, adrenaline. Because adrenaline, as you know, make vasoconstriction and minimize the absorption and slowing the absorption and, of course, flattening the curve of the plasma. So this is the only adjuvant to affect the absorption of local anesthetic. The other adjuvants mainly to prolong the effect of local anesthetic or to hasten or fasten the onset, but they don't affect the toxicity. The curve of toxicity is not affected by this. If you add dexamethasone, it will not affect toxicity. If, the, if you inject high dose, it will get toxicity. If you not inject high dose, you'll not get toxicity. The same for the uh, 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 alpha alpha two uh, blocker. So a lot of my, um, the medication adjuvants will not affect toxicity, but it will affect the duration or onset of the block. Okay. Without so the last. Benefit. Okay. The last question we have here is to. Should we delay or minimize the use of midazolam in, in elderly patients to avoid risk of masking neurological manifestations of systemic local toxicity? No, no. Look, uh, 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 the, 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 you have two types of local anesthetic toxicity. The first one is CNS, and the second one is cardiovascular. So the CNF, it's happened, the treatment is metazolam. So you already treated. If the cardiovascular happened, you're already monitoring the patient. It will not mask you are, if the cardiovascular toxicity occurring, you're already monitoring the patient. So once it happened, you try to treat it. So don't, this not a big, yes, there's some uh, physician think that is the metazolam delaying the, because it's masking the symptoms of the CNS, so the toxicity will happen and delayed your management. It's not the issue. Sometimes the toxicity is only CNS. So if Madhuzalam is there and there is no toxicity happened, خلاص, this is better. You get it? But once any problem is cardiovascular, treat it. If you find tachycardia, hemodynamic stability, so you can treat it. And Madhuzalam does not mask this as, as you imagine. I give Madhuzalam routinely in every patient and still have toxicity. It's not okay. one of the things. So my thinking about this question, so if we give, if we give Madhuzalam, so we've already treated it. So is a patient will miss the chance of having uh, intralipid as a, as a treatment or it will... The intralipid is to treat symptoms. Okay. Symptoms. So once the symptoms are controlled, I don't inject intralipid for... If the symptoms are okay. controlled by itself, no, no need. You got okay, it? Okay, so... The, the, the intral target to treat the symptom, to stabilize the hemodynamic, uh, the hemodynamic, to stabilize the oxygen saturation, to stabilize the supplementary function and CNS function. We treat symptoms. We don't treat the toxicity itself. If the plasma is high, but there is no symptom, I'm not giving any medication. You get it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank okay. you very much. Very, very, very nice lecture. It was very uh, informative. So thank you. And uh, now uh, we will go to Dr. Amina bin Yusuf and her lecture about uh, adverse effects of uh, muscle relaxants. So, uh, Dr. Amina, you have the mic now, so we are going to enjoy your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Saad Mahdi for all the time and effort in putting this webinar together. Thanks to you, Dr. Salama, and thanks to Dr. Taha for this great lecture. Sorry, Dr. Taha, you are muted. Sorry. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Amina. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sorry. Next one. Next one. Yes. <laughs> the purpose, okay. The purpose of this lecture is to show how residual neuromuscular block 
impacts postoperative pulmonary complications, and whether we can modify the risk by improving certain aspects in daily clinical practice. Each year, more than 230 million major surgical procedures are performed worldwide, and most include administration of neuromuscular blocking agents. They are considered as essential because they facilitate airway instrumentation and improve surgical outcome. However, even if we know that multiple um, factors as anesthetic, surgical, patient variables contribute to postoperative uh, pulmonary complications. Several studies have linked use of neuromuscular blocking agents with postoperative pulmonary complications. They are a major contributor to the overall risk of surgery. 14 to 30 percent of patients that have this complication die within 30 days of major surgery, and the length of hospital stay is prolonged by up to 17 days. Healthcare costs are increased by such complications by over than 25,000 per hospital admission. To date, there is no standard definition of postoperative pulmonary complication. Incidence rate consequently vary dramatically from 2.2% in peripheral surgeries to nearly 40% in thoracic surgeries. Surgical sites that are close to diaphragm and require use of neuromuscular blocking agents. Residual neuromuscular block and postoperative Complications is an old story that never ends. In 1954, Bitcher and Todd started their article by saying, evidence will be given that where the muscle relaxants are involved, an appreciable increase in the anesthesia death rate is presented. Then in 1986, Cooper and colleagues investigated anesthesia-related complications leading to admission to intensive care unit and found that half of the cases were associated with incomplete neuromuscular recovery. In another study, Dr. Sorin Brule, Mohamed Naguib, and Ronald Miller estimated approximately 112,000 patients in United States uh, estimated that the, this, num this number of patients were at risk of adverse events associated with discharge from the PECU with residual neuromuscular blockade. Over the decades, many researchers conducted studies around this patient safety issue. However, resi residual neuromuscular block is still a prevalent condition. And surprisingly, Anastasia community worldwide underestimates the incidence of residual neuromuscular block at the time of tracheal extubation and arrival to the post anesthesia care unit. Let's talk about this incidence. There is three well-designed studies conducted in Canada, United States, and China called recite studies, residual careerization and its incidence at tracheal extubation. The first one is a Canadian study, uh, which is a prospective observational study, I'm sorry, a prospective observational study of the incidence of residual neuromuscular block at eight Canadian hospitals. Relatively healthy patients undergoing abdominal surgery were assessed using train of four ratio me measured immediately before extubation and at arrival to the PECU. 302 patients, was in, uh, patients were enrolled. Rocuronium was used in 99% of cases and neostigmine in 73% of cases. The incidence of residual neuromuscular block was 64% at tracheal extubation and 57% at the PECU. The Chinese research study found that the incidence was about 58%. And the most recent one, the research, uh, the American research study found uh, 64 
percent point uh, 64.7 percent as the incidence of patients uh, at the time of extubation let me know how residual neuromuscular block contribute to the development of postoperative pulmonary complications the muscle weakness impaired the contraction of ventilatory muscles with atelectasis formation, inability to cough, impairment, swallowing, and silent aspiration pneumonia. Postoperative hypoxemia is, uh, has numerous uh, mechanisms, including deleterious effects on both chemoreceptors and upper airway patency, in addition to effects on phrenic nerve diaphragm neuromuscular junction. Residual neuromuscular block um, leads to reduction in forced vital capacity and peak exploratory flow in the immediate postoperative period. There are several studies that showed these critical events. Now that we know that Residual neuromuscular block are critical events. They have to be identified, they have to be treated, and they have to be excluded before the patient is extubated. How is residual neuromuscular block defined? In the 70s, a train of four ratio over 0.7 was an acceptable was accepted as a, was an acceptable threshold for an acceptable recovery but since 1990 uh, racial um, value over 0.9 is now um, defined and recently studies have shown that the train of four ratio over 0.95 could reduce postoperative complications compared with a ratio over than 0.9. The question is, why a definition solely based on neuromuscular block monitoring? The evaluation or the assessment of neuro, the neuromuscular function can be done by two ways, a quantitative or objective one, and a qualitative or subjective method. The objective monitoring is defined as a, the quantitative, sorry, monitoring is defined as an objective real-time measurement of the train of four ratio. The qualitative evaluation can be achieved through peripheral nerve stimulation or clinical scenes. The qualitative assessment using peripheral nerve stimulation devices depends on the anesthesia practitioner estimating the strength of muscle contractions in response to train of force stimulation by visual or tactile means only. And after the train of force ratio recovers up to over to 0.4, clinicians can no longer detect the presence of fade by technician. Clinical things do not guarantee complete resolution of neuromuscular block as at a train of four ratio less than 0.7, 70% of patient, patients can sustain a head, lift, a head lift for five seconds. It's shown clearly in this slide that the head lift test correspond to a train of four ratio at 0.4, which is insufficient. If we, if we want to understand the relation between muscle relaxant and reversal, we have to return to basics. Not all muscles are equally sensitive to the effects of muscle relaxant. Respiratory muscles are considered to be more resistant as compared with peripheral muscles. Corrugator supercilia is a resistant muscle and its kinetic is comparable to those of laryngeal muscles and diaphragm. You can see it clearly in this, uh, in this slide. Okay, so we have two groups of 
uh, muscles, the resistance, and the sensitive swan. The resistance are the corrugator superciliae, as, as we said, the laryngeal muscles, the diaphragm, and the rictus abdominis muscles. The sensitive swans are orbicularis oculi, adductor, adductor pollicis, and the pharyngeal muscles genuglossus. To detect a residual neuromuscular block, monitoring should be carried out on a muscle with high sensitivity and slow recovery kinetics. The adductor pollicis meets this profile and is recommended. Monitoring of neuromuscular blockade intraoperatively is recommended since 2018. Given the wide variability of patients' pharmacologic response to these drugs, neuromuscular block, and block monitoring is mandatory. We can see in this uh, study that uh, included 526 patients that received a single dose of a neuromuscular blocking agent. These patients were monitored at the arrival to the PECU. There were no monitoring during surgery and no reversal at the end of surgery. 238 patients arrived to the PECU more than two hours after injection and 33% of them had a train of four ratio less than 0.9 at the adductor policies. So 33% of them had a residual neuromuscular block. How to use neuromuscular block monitoring? There are different devices, different sites, and different neuromuscular stimulation patterns. That depends on surgical times for example, at the induction of anesthesia, we need to assess the neuromuscular block at the corrugator supercilii because it's a muscle that has the same pharmacokinetic and the same sensitivity to neuromuscular uh, blocking drugs as the laryngeal muscles. But during surgery, to assess the deep of the block, we need sometimes when the train of four is at zero, no response, to um, use post-tetanic count. And if we want, if we, um, if we obtain more than five responses, this um, means that we have to inject again neuromuscular broken drugs. And finally, at the end of surgery, the adductor policies is the best site to assess residual neuromuscular block. Now that we have defined and detected a residual neuromuscular block, we have to treat it by using a reversal agent. There are two known reversal agents, the neostigmine and the sugamidex. The neostigmine can be used with all depolar non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. It has a low cost, but some inconvenience, as it can't reverse deep blocks and has parasympathetic effects needing the association to atrophy. In uh, the conference of uh, 2018, the French guidelines on the muscle relaxants and uh, uh, reversal um, put some, um, some recommendation or some, uh, some strong agreement around uh, the use of new stigmine. I think that the most important one is to take into consideration that since new stigmine is a reversal acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, it induces an increase of uh, the, the concentration of acetylcholine, but it, its administrations need a higher concentration of acetylcholine than the concentration of uh, neuromuscular blocking drugs. So we have to wait until we will have four responses to the trino four stimulation to be able to inject neostigmine. 
associated always with atrophy. Now let me talk about Sugamedex. It can be only used with rocuronium and accessory with verocuronium. It has a higher cost compared to neostigmine, but um, in the Congress, in the French Congress of 2009, it was considered as the perfect um, agent because it can rapidly um, reverse a neuromuscular block and its efficiency is not related to the, to the general anesthesia technique and doesn't need the association to atrophy. We see that it's a direct uh, mechanism by encapsulating the molecule of rocuronium. It's not, it's not only an encapsulation because we can see that after encapsulating free molecules of rocuronium, there's a phenomenon of attraction of the other molecules that are present at the neuromuscular junction. So this attraction will create another uh, concentration of neuromuscular blocks, uh, yes, at the in the plasma that will be encapsulated. We can see here that the Sugama, the Sugama Dexus use doesn't need four responses to the train of four stimulation. And since we have two responses, we can inject Sugama Dex uh, at the dose of two milligram per kilo. Moreover, we have, if we don't have any response to the train of four, we have to achieve a post-tetanic count. And since we have one or two responses that uh, signify a deep uh, block, we can inject Sigamadex at the dose of four milligram per kilogram of ideal body uh, index. Uh, wait, sorry. So to the question, residual neuromuscular block and postoperative pulmonary complications, can we improve our practice? The response is yes, but we have to take into consideration some points. The first is the high incidence of residual neuromuscular block that remain a common modifiable risk factor for postoperative pulmonary complication that clinical signs or tests do not guarantee complete resolution of a neuromuscular block and should be abandoned, that the term of monitor will be restricted to quantitative devices in the future. But when it's not available, the use of peripheral nerve stimulation is mandatory. And regardless to reversal agent, its use must be guided by neuromuscular block monitoring results. And uh, to conclude, I just want to repeat the words of Leonardo di Vinci. I have been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Being willing is not enough, we must do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Salama? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so I have the first question here and there's a question and, and answer from Mohammed Seliman. So what do you recommend if a patient got accidental subcutaneous rocuronium? So, um, so in that case, I have seen um, like a tissue cannulas, cannula that doesn't go Can into the vein the or something and we sorry can you repeat the question okay so if we have got accidental subcutaneous injection of rocuronium how okay. can we manage that ah okay um as i know if we are afraid about um any toxicity any uh, any any um phenomenon of allergy 
we have to inject in subcutaneous. So I think there's no, no worries about this issue. This problem, it's not a problem. Okay, thank you. So anyone else has any you have questions? also You have also, you can also monitor it and uh, have a reversal agent. But because there is a such very inter-individual variability in the response of the person, so we have always to assess the response of the body to this uh, to this agent, and then you will see. I have a question, uh, uh, not just for you, for all our colleagues and senior here. Uh, do you think that uh, the uh, monitoring of muscle accent must be an as a standard monitoring now? Because we have an access a standard monitoring for everything, but for muscle relaxant, especially uh, all the new machine have a uh, muscle relaxant monitoring and module for that. Do you think it's a time for that? We think, uh, I think it's too late. The purpose uh, the, of my uh, lecture is to show how monitoring of neuromuscular block is important and how anesthesiologists must work to have it in their operating room. So it must be an, uh, what's called an ASA monitoring. It is mandatory. Yeah. It is yeah. mandatory. And if you don't have a quantitative monitoring of neuromuscular block, at least you must have a peripheral nerve stimulation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amina. Anyone else has any questions for Dr. Amina? Okay, we have a question here from Fatma. So what is the safety of Sugamadex in pediatrics? Yes, I, uh, I didn't uh, include uh, the the management of neuromuscular blockade in children, because it's not uh, in one side my daily practice, and uh, I cover the adults, but uh, the safety, yes, we can use uh, Sugamadex in uh, infants, in uh, children. Okay, so it's safe, thank you. Um, okay, so I've got a few seconds here for any questions, okay. if anyone is happy to Sorry, but, send uh, any questions for now. Okay, for, have... uh, for Dr. Fatma, I just want her to uh, take a look to the French recommendation and guidelines edited in uh, 2018. At the end of the recommendation, they talk about uh, the use of neuromuscular blockade and reversal in children. I think uh, she will find more uh, relevant uh, answers. Okay, so I have here a very broad question. So it says, is there difference between using neuromuscular blocking agents in as a bolus or continuous infusion? Oh, okay. I think that uh, we are at the time of an enhanced recovery uh, after surgery. And I don't think that uh, a continuous infusion of uh, um, neuromuscular blocking agents is really um, justified. But in case, uh, you know, as I, uh, as I showed in my lecture, after only one single dose, Two hours after 33% of patients had a residual neuromuscular block, what about a continuous infusion? If uh, you, do, uh, you do anesthesia in that way, I think you have uh, to, uh, to, to conduct your patient to intensive uh, care unit and delay the extubation. This is what I do in uh, the most... Um, um, the most um, complicated, the most uh, invasive surgeries. Okay, thank you very you much. Have to thank monitor you. once again. You have to monitor. You have to establish the statute of your patients uh, regarding neuromuscular block. So 
So I have here one more question. So that it says, is continuous muscle relaxant infusion justified for robotic surgery? Justify what? Sorry. Sorry. So I will say the question again. So is continuous muscle relaxant infusion is justified for robotic surgery? Or uh, which kind of surgery? Robotic, or, robotic. Or, ah, robotic surgery. Okay. Oh, of, I have uh, not that much, uh, not that much experience in robotic surgery. But what I can say to you, I can extrapolate a little by saying that actually, to date, there is no recommendation for using high levels of neuromuscular block for laparoscopic surgery. This is what I can say to you. Certainly. Okay, thank you very much. You're so welcome. the last question here we have is, uh, what is the evidence to have two twitches before giving Sogamadex? What is the evidence we have? Yes. You know, uh, at least I can say to you that uh, we don't need any high response to give Sogamadex. As I have uh, showed, when you uh, use the post tetanic count. You know that the post tetanic count is uh, to assess, is used to assess a deep block during surgery, to uh, to not uh, be in war with the surgeons when they say patient is not relaxed enough. You have to, and you have a train of four about zero response. You say no, my patient is uh, adequately relaxed. No, you have to. When you have a train of four ratio at zero, you have to um, to use uh, or to achieve a post tetanic count and the number of response must be under five response. So if I return to the question, two twitches, it's not a, it's not a problem. We have response. Sugamadex, you, Sugamadex mechanism is an encapsulation, but with neostigmine, it's another whole story. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amina. So Certainly, if, we... if, if, if you allow me to um, to add yeah. a little bit about uh, about this uh, comment here, we have uh, three doses of Sugamedix. Uh, one is two milligram per kilogram body weight, oh. and four milligram per kilogram body weight, and eight milligram per kilogram body weight, and even some people go to a little bit more, sixteen milligram per kilogram body weight for the deeper block. So, um, uh, presence of twitches before giving. Uh, sugar medix is not that essential if you want to, uh, to, to, to reverse your patient, unless you want to, um, to judge the dose for sugar medix. Yes, I just can add also that when we have difficult airway management and planet difficult airway management, sugar medix at the dose of 16 milligram per kilogram. Uh, allows an extubation after around five minutes. It's nearly like uh, 16 alkaline. But um, my problem is about the twitches. Do you mean twitches or train of four response? Two response to train of four or two twitches? It's not the same. That's right. That's correct. Um... Okay. Thank you very much. So I Thank presume we have answered all of the questions we had here. Um, no more questions I, here. I can't find any more. So uh, for now, uh, so we reach the end now. So, okay. so it's with uh, you now, Dr. Saad. Thank you much, Dr. Salama, for uh, sharing this uh, lovely session tonight. And uh, it's really very important. Uh, uh, the characteristic for this webinar tonight is extremely important for practical, clinical, and the exam, and the academic as well. If uh, somebody uh, setting the exam, if somebody setting the regional anesthesia, if somebody working in the laparoscopic or general anesthesia using muscle relaxant, how to avoid complication uh, during daily practice is absolutely fascinating to lectures. And I'm so proud for um, hosting uh, this um, elite bunch of uh, panelists tonight. And uh, I'm sure 
um, Prof. Ahmad Taha will continue with us, and uh, Dr. Amina will, uh, will attract her to give us another uh, lecture in the near future. And I'm so proud of all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmad Salama. Thank you, Dr. Yasser, Dr. Hazim Yaseen, Dr. Fatma Doma. Thank you so much, all of you, all excellent panelists tonight. And uh, we will continue. Next uh, Sunday, we will have Dr. Ahmad Nabil uh, Nasr and Dr. Sudetta from India. They are going to talk about another extremely important topics, uh, uh, clinical perioperative uh, endocrine emergencies in uh, anesthesia, and another complication of uh, 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 abdominal surgery in intensive care. Two important uh, uh, lectures next week, and thank you very much for um, attending tonight, and from me and all panelists, thank you, and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you.